morning. Good morning, everyone. Our service today begins with the processional hymn 524. 524. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be the kingdom of God now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace with his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. Our first reading this morning is from, jo is from Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and, and summered, summered, summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, thus say the Lord God of Israel, 
Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. I will save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous. But the Lord will deliver him out of all of them. He will keep safe all his bones. Not one of them shall be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants. And none will be punished who trust in him. Our second reading is from the book of Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and have, having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the spirit of the sword of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all time in every prayer and supplication, so that and keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness and mystery of the gospel, for which I am the ambassador in chains. I pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel hymn, hymn number 425, 425.
The Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoops, I'm sorry, this is last week. <laughs> ah, here we go. <laughs> and Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father who eats me. Whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept this? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first that there, was, there were ones that did not believe. And who was the one who would betray him? And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So, finally, we're in that last week of John chapter 6. So, to give you a little reminder of where we are. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. It is the day after he's performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. Jesus, for all intents and purposes, has achieved rock star status. You know what that means, right? Groupies and followers. Everybody wants a piece of him. So, Jesus does indeed have a large following of people who follow him around. And they seem to know his every move. They know his itinerary. They know where he hangs out. They know what he's doing, when and where. And so, the day before, he did this, the, this, the um, miracle of the 5,000. And then he wanted to make him king. Because this man can provide for us. And so he eludes them on the mountain. But the next day, they show up at the synagogue in Capernaum, where he's preaching. And they ask for more. They ask Jesus for a sign. One that is similar to what the Israelites experienced in the wilderness during Exodus. And it is a sign that goes, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus goes on to interpret this verse about manna throughout the rest of the chapter away that makes the people uncomfortable. He declares himself to be the bread of life. Not just the manna that they got in the wilderness that gave them life. He is the life of everlasting life. 
He is spiritual life. Last week we looked at how the Jewish leadership were affected by that and their point of view of what happened. And many of the crowd were upset. Although the crowd was intensely enthusiastic about the idea of Jesus being like Moses, and they wanted, to, and they wanted someone who would provide for them the way Joseph, where Moses and God provided for the Israelites in the desert, they became unhappy and they rejected Jesus' message because they couldn't identify who he is. His credentials didn't match up. He was the hometown boy. How could he call himself the son of God? And so they rejected the notion that the, lo that the local boy could ever call himself ego am I, the I am. And so they rejected the message along with that that he can be the living bread because they were blinded by that need for credentials. And they also had, of course, no idea of the Eucharist. That hasn't happened yet. This Last Supper thing had not happened. And John doesn't really talk about it in this way. When you read John, he talks about the foot washing. But he doesn't really go into the Last Supper. It is here in chapter 6 that he introduces the notion, the idea of the Eucharist, the idea of the bread. And it's here he introduces it in a way that's different from Matthew and the others. In that it's not just a sacrament that to perform to remember Christ. It is a way of life. So many of them reject Jesus' teaching because they think literally rather than thinking in a spiritual manner. And so for most of them, Jesus is talking about cannibalism and their knowledge of Torah law because they're all knowledgeable. You know, we're talking about the Jewish leadership here. Because of their knowledge of Torah law, they know cannibalism is a sin. And so because no reference to the Last Supper has ever been made and they don't know about it, they're only thinking in a literal manner. Like, How could this man ask us to eat his flesh? How could this man ask us to drink his blood? On top of saying that he is God. What madness. Another way to look at rejection from Jesus is to look back at the Hebrews in Exodus again that is always mentioned throughout this chapter. And although initially they herald God because of the fact that he provided for them, the Hebrews of that time also grumbled. They also complained to God as a Moses in the wilderness. They did not trust God to provide for them. They did not trust God to protect them. And over and over they kept asking the question, where will we get food? Where will we get water? Where will we get this? Where will we get that? Who will provide for us? Who will lead us here? And they constantly grumbled because they did not have that trust. They did not have that belief in God. Similarly, when we read this chapter, we can see that Jesus initially, when he gave them that miraculous food and bread and fish, they heralded him as king. He was supposed to be David sent. But then, just the very next day, they grumbled against him because of his teachings of manna. How can you be the manna from heaven? What impossibility you're saying. But today, we're not looking at the crowd anymore. Today, we look at the disciples themselves. And how did they interpret this teaching? Those who followed him because they accepted him. Because to them, he was the true rabbi. He was the true prophet. He was the Messiah. They had followed him for two years and had seen him do miraculous things and had heard multiple teachings from him. They too had difficulty with this message. So why did they have so much trouble with the teachings of today in the synagogue? Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living father sent me, I have I live because of the Father, and whoever eats me will live because of me. Now part of this is the language. So you have to understand, earlier in the chapter, when he uses the language of phage, which is the Greek word he's using that for eat, he means to eat hurriedly, to take up this food that he's giving you, this manna that God gives us, when it's only there for a limited time, so you must eat it hurriedly. 
But then when he talks about eating now, he's changed the verb. And he's using torgon, which is a word that means ravenous. It means desperate. It means eating like an animal who's grabbing and clawing at food. Why the change? What is the idea that Jesus is trying to get over? What is this about this eating and going that made them so uncomfortable? Jesus, what really is Jesus trying to do here is he's trying to describe a desperate hunger for salvation. And they missed it completely. So Jesus is saying we cannot just be hungry for, for, for him. We must be ravenous for the spirit. He is saying to all who listen and who desire him must be desiring him in that way. All who listen must desire God in that way. He's asking for a passionate, a very passionate existence between him and God. And in return, Jesus promises that he will be, abide in us just as we abide in him. That his spirit will be in us. The spirit of truth will abide in us all the days of our life and always. It is a relationship that Jesus is trying to describe to forge with his disciples. Now, I mean, for some of us, we're, we're thinking, this is a foreign way of thinking about things. Well, just a few years ago, I heard a song on the radio by, anyone have ever heard of Amy Grant? Amy Grant. She had a wonderful song in it that she says, better than a hallelujah. And if you listen to the words of this song, she says that God hears the desperate cries the drunk in the road, as the mother crying for her dying child, as the guy begging for his life in the OR or the cancer patient. He says God hears those better than the hallelujahs that we say in church because they are truthful. They are the one true time when we are truthful with God. It is a desperate relationship that we are conveying to God. And as I read this, that song came back to me and I thought, ah, Is this the relationship that God wants with us because we are truthful in that form? I mean, when we look back, we can see and grasp the meaning of what we're seeing. But back then, they, did not, they weren't able to do that, at least not yet. I mean, Jesus says the same prayer in his high priest prayer back on John 17 when we read that later on, when he says that they may be one with you, my Father, as I am one with you. And I am in you. And they may also be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me when we, God sees them. But in order to achieve this, we must be able to trust God. And that's what he wants. That trust. That unheld back trust. That trust that we have when we have no other choice but to trust. And sometimes it takes desperation to get that trust from someone. That trust to rely on someone when we have no other choice but to trust them. Paul said this is a stumbling block for us. And that stumbling block is the cross. But we must learn to depend on God and get past that stumbling block. Now some of the disciples did indeed learn. But some also grumbled like the crowds. And this grumbling disciple links them like the crowd, back to the ancient Hebrews, who grumbled and grumbled about God providing. People of God sometimes have to understand that our life in the church is not going to be an easy one. People of God are not exempt from unusual difficulties of life. And sometimes we find ourselves as the objects of persecution. We Christians are always tempted to imagine that God has abandoned us, that he's forgotten us, and that he's, not, he's untrustworthy when we're in times of, of desperation. Some of us, the first thing we say is, where are you, God, when I was sick? Where are you, God, when my mother died? Where are you, God, when my son got into the accident? But this is on furthest from the truth. God is always there. He's always there holding our hands, even in the most desperate of times. And especially in the most desperate of times. He treats us as we need. He gives us what we need in that situation. Not everything we want, but what we need at that time. 
Jesus is always there holding our hands at the most difficult hour, giving us exactly what we want, exactly what we need at that moment to get through it. And this is the part that makes us stumble. This is the part that offends us. God's ways we cannot understand are not our ways. In our way, we would have all the power we need. In our way, we would have all the money that we need. In our way, we would make the choices to make our lives comfortable at all times. In our way, all the charitable functions would have more than enough money to take care of the poor and needy. There would be no going out to beg. People would automatically give. It's the opportunity for power and control that we look for that God does not always give us because his way is not ours. And we have to understand that. One of the greatest examples I've had of this is a couple of years ago, you know these office pools? When the lotto is up there, like 100,000, 100 million, you know, we all get together, we start putting money in, and we say, oh, yes, it's great. It's an obscene amount of money to have. Well, while I was in this pool this year, one of the things that someone said is that, you know something? I really don't need the 100 million. All I want is 100,000 to pay off every debt I have and live comfortably for the rest of my life. And I thought about what that person had said. I said, with all the money out there, that's all you want? But then another co-worker jumped in immediately and he said, I'm greedy. I want the whole thing. I want the whole shebang. Don't leave a dime behind. Of course, everyone agreed with the other guy. Not many agreed with the guy who just wanted enough to get him through. As parents in the world, we don't always give our children everything they want because giving them everything they want sometimes is the wrong thing, right? Who knows that better than our Heavenly Father? We don't always have to get exactly what we want, but we will get exactly what we need. And that's part of the problem with us. We keep wanting more. And when we don't get more, we don't trust. And we say that God is not with us. And that's the problem of us, of the blindness that we have in the relationship with God. That we have to realize that God is indeed a parent, just like we are. He is a father, just like we are. And his relationship is as such. And he's always giving us exactly what we need at the time that we need it. But we never want to share the cost. Because there's a cost for discipleship. Christian discipleship is a discipleship of following our maker. The gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus also causes us to stumble. And it's a hard relationship, but we are there. Because in the end, the promise is eternal life. When Christ calls us to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, he's inviting us to participate in his death. He's inviting us to participate in difficult things. And looking back at the way that these people fall, they did not want that invitation. Those Christians, brothers and sisters, who have been martyred, accepted the invitation and took on the difficulty. They never compromised the gospel. They accepted Jesus Christ as he was. They accepted Jesus Christ in their desperation and their desire to be with him. And he fulfilled their every need. The church was founded on this desperate love, this desperate need to be with God. And it's on this that God built his church. But the church today is always tempted to remove what is offensive from the gospel. They're tempted to remove what they find to be offensive. And in the end, they sometimes tailor the message to the world's values. Someone has always said that knowing what the church is going to do tomorrow is looking at what the world says today. One of the examples that I can point out is the prosperity gospel. You've heard about that wonderful gospel that's out there popular in some of the churches out there, where if you follow God and do all his work, you will get everything that you wanted in life monetarily. You will get everything in life successfully. You will be a wonderful, successful person if you follow God's law. That could not be furthest from the truth. Not everyone is going to be the Michael Jordans of the world. Not everyone is going to be a conglomerate. Not everyone is going to be a millionaire. The gospel of our Lord and Jesus Christ never said that. And so the prosperity gospel has twisted God's words into something of a dream that can 
never be filled. And once not filled, that's when people say, God hasn't done anything for me. Because they were taught that that's what God is about. But that's wrong. But a gospel, but a gospel with no offense is like a surgeon without a scalpel. Having no power to heal the wounds of our soul. The gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ spoken truly will always offend somebody. It will always redeem somebody. To those of us who desperately believe, the cross will always be an offense to someone, except for those who are redeemed by it. Thus the church must always be ready to give offense and speak out for Christ against the destructive beliefs and behaviors that the world sometimes put in there as attractive. The disciples of today are offended by Jesus' words. Some of them, those who left, were offended by his words because they're still thinking in the old Torah literal way. And so they could not understand what the bread of life really mean. But all they saw is here we are, is this local boy telling us that he's God and that's an offensive thing. So Jesus asked them, what would they think when they see the Son of Man ascending into heaven? What would they think when they actually saw him in his glory? Because if this offends them, then that should surely offend them too. What would they think when they see him sitting on the right hand of God? And what would they think when they saw him lifted on the cross, stripped naked, and sacrificed as the Lamb of God? That would also offend them. But later, as a resurrected Christ, the world would again sense who he really is. Some did not even try to understand. They just turned away and walked away. And they didn't want to do anything else. Because guess what? He's not the divided king that they expected him to be. He's not the great leader based on what he's saying to them here. Today, this has made clear, and it is still made clear, not everyone who hears the word of God believes. Not everyone who claims to believe truly understands. We don't know how many disciples turned away because it's not said. But we know that the twelve remain. We know that they were desperate enough to believe. And their desperation shows in the answer to their question. What do you want? Do you wish to go away? And my favorite, uh, my favorite disciple answers. Peter. Peter who says what comes right to his mind. No filter. And he comes up and he said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter answers shows that he understands a little of what is happening. He shows that he knows that he has to abide in Christ. So for Christ to abide in him. He and the twelve stick with Jesus and they continue to stick with Jesus for the rest of that year. Even through the, the, the crucifixion. They were there to witness the resurrection. And they were there to see the ascension. And in doing so they represent what we Today as Christians must understand that we must trust in God to provide for us so that we can see eternity. The apostles stick closely to Jesus because they understood that he was indeed the bread of life. And they listened to his words. This is their only real option and they knew that. It is our only real option. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we partake in our Eucharist today, as we partake in the Eucharist in the weeks to come, let us understand that it is, just, it is not only just a sacrament, but it is an invitation for us to become partakers in the spiritual food. It is an inv invitation for us to abide in God and build that relationship with him. It is the instruction of our in salvation, of what will be given for us this year. It reminds us that we are bound to one another through the love of Jesus the Christ, our God. And finally, like Peter, we must admit that we come to believe and know that Jesus the Christ is the Holy One of God. That is what our Eucharist means. In the name of God the Father, and the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We continue our service with the words of the Nicene Creed found on page six of your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not known, but being the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate to the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people of Form 3, found on page 387 of your prayer books or page 6 of your bulletins. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. That light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we all succumb to share your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We lift up in prayer to you, O Lord, for our bishops, Michael, William, and Shelton, our celebrant, and all bishops and other ministers. For our Joe, our president, Carmela, our vice president, Robert and Corey, our senators, Andy, our congressman, Philip, our governor, the justices of the Supreme Court, and all who serve in our federal, state, and local governments and for those serving in our military and public safety services, especially John, Jeffrey, Scott, Joe, DJ, Michael, Gus, Kevin, John, Chris, Matthew, Dan, Matthew, Shane, Grayson, Justin, Joseph, Mark, Jeremy, Bob, Kale, Christophe, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Lewis, Kale, Jeremiah, Eddie, Ryan, Andrew, Alex, Helena, Danny, and Stephen. For those on our parish prayer list, Doris, Tom, Charlene, Alan, Millie, Julie, Hallie, Michael, MJ, Beth, Joan, Bernadine, Harriet, Stephanie, Pat, Jeanette, Debbie, Alan, Jessica, John, Samantha, Ellie, Mary, Paul, Joe, Michael, Joyce, Samantha, Mara, John, Brian, Frank, Ron, Nick, Sandy, Robin, Lisa, Caroline, Charlie, Julia, Frank, Laura, Nick, Don, Lillian, Dennis, James, Ella, and Bill. 
We offer thanksgiving for the blessing of this life, especially for Audrey on her birthday. For those for whom more memorials are offered this week, David, Nicholas, Ellen, and the parents and grandparents of Carol Bishop. People may add their own petitions. Dear God, let us pray for the people of Haiti and all that they are going through. Help the world to come together to seriously help and affect their change. May they be able throughout this time to finally get a government that cares and is not corrupt. We ask the same they go for the people in Afghanistan who are enduring that change from the democratic rule to the Taliban. We pray for the women of that country who are so much in tear and fear, tears and in fear of the life that they're being subjected back to. I ask you, dear God, to intercede on their behalf and make this world somehow understand what they're going through and somehow intercede in making their lives better. We also pray for the people of Long Island and in New England who are going to be hit with a hurricane today. Guide them, they're going to protect them, but no one will be damaged and hurt and that they make it through this storm without any grief. Almighty and eternal God, rule of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet each other in peace and love. Are there any announcements today? No announcements. Okay. So then, offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving and make your vows unto the Most High. The hymn for the offertory, hymn number 516. 516.
continue our service. The Eucharistic Prayer A, found on page 7 of your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share in our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to it, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memory of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death and resurrection and ascension, we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them by the Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink, of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity and constancy and peace. And at the last day, bring us all with your saints to be the joy of our eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus, to your son, Jesus Christ, by him, in him, and with him, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we trust against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, sacrifice for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feel them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The 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 body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the holy sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart, so that I may unite myself wholly to you, now and forever. Amen. Let us sit, let's sit together to pray for the human family. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infects our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggles confession, to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding and keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. The recessional hymn, hymn number 460, 460.
in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the God of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, and all the prophets guide you and protect you as you go through this week. And may you have a wonderful and internal week.